So thank you for this uh, new day with me, day number four. So today you will, you will you will see for the first time some explanation on 3Ds. Tomorrow will be will be the other model code, but today is 3Ds. So typically we will enter now really in computer modeling of dislocations at this uh, dislocation scale. But before going to that scale, there is one more chapter on uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And I, I know that most of you, or may, not most, but some of you are dealing with molecular dynamics. So I will show you also the, I think you know what I will show, plus so, so, some explain, some uh, applications uh, MD. So this is my chapter, which was called Dislocation Dynamics Modeling. So chapter three, which will be, which was here, you see, Dislocation Dynamics Modeling. And we will start at the atomic scale. Just the first lecture will be on that. Second lecture will be on this. So the micro scale, let's say dislocation dynamics scale. And then I will show you an application to fatigue after that. Okay. So this is the plan of the day. So this will be this afternoon and this morning we do that. Okay. So to, to start with that, I think the good things to do is to look at the scales and the times we, we could simulate. We can, we can handle with different tools, different numeric so it's, it's written in French, but I think you, you may understand. So this is molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics, and this is the space you can do using molecular dynamics. And this is the time you can, uh, you can uh, access to using molecular dynamics. So what did I put here? Here I put, a, I put typically some straight lines, which corresponds to the limit of the model. I mean, as soon as you are dealing with molecular dynamics, you are dealing with atoms. The size of an atom is typically 10 minus 10 meters, or one angstrom, or a couple of angstroms. And if you want to have a good statistic, you need a, a box big enough. So typically, a 100 size, typically, 100, 100 atoms per side, that's the minimum if you want to get some good statistic. So this is, a, let's say, a, a bottom line of the model. And you could do the same for the time scales, because you are using the femtosecond for the time step. So at least you do a thousand steps to get some uh, realistic statistics. And this is, again, a bottom line of the model. Now you can go, you can make much bigger, much longer simulations, of course. But what will be the problem here? If I take a big volume, long time, what will be the problem? The problem will be computation time. Computation time will be a nightmare. It will take months to get something. So this is why the bigger the volume, the smaller the time you can get. So it's something like that. I put something decreasing. But the, the more the, the computer power is increasing, the more this point is coming toward uh, that direction. So, okay, you are, so you have this translation here. So the dashed line here is just the, the computer, computational uh, limits, but which is continuously increasing toward that direction. And I can define the same for my dislocation dynamics modeling. And again, you have this translation. And for finite element, there is no, no big issue, I would say, because it's just defined on the, on the mesh size you can put. This is the single crystalline finite element. And this is the polycrystalline finite element modeling. I didn't put phase feed, I didn't put have initial, but you can add up more if you want, of course. But these are the three I will, uh, I will use my lectures, so this is why they are, they are shown here. And to highlight this, uh, one, one more detail before going further. Uh, this is very recent, but you can see some overlapping of the space uh, covered by the different tools. There is an overlapping here and there. So it means that nowadays, and this was not true 10, or maybe 20 years ago, Nowadays, you can uh, tackle down the same, exact same problem using three different tools, more or less. Typically, the dislocation junction, you can look at it using molecular dynamics, dislocation dynamics, and more or less, not the junction, but the hardening you can have access to. So you can do some kind of uh, multi-scale modeling using those three tools with a continuity of the scales. There is no gap between the, between the two. So this is very interesting, and I think this is why it motivates a lot people to work on dislocation dynamics, just to fill the gap between MD and uh, FEM. And this is why now dislocation dynamics is so popular, I think. It was, it was a rec it's a recent model, you will see, but it was just developed in the late uh, 90s. So it's quite a, a new model, but nowadays it's used very well in, uh, a lot in the world just because of this, uh, this uh, typical uh, possibilities of this, uh, this code. So today I will show you uh, molecular dynamics. So we'll focus more on that, that aspect here. And just to show you the capability, I will take one of the biggest, um, largest scale simulations that was done. It's quite an old one. I, I, I found a new one, but I had, don't have the movie for that one. So this one I show you here was done by Farid Abraham at, at, um, at IBM. 
So it was just one billion atom. Now we can do more. I found something at 20 times this. So 20 times bigger. But 20 times bigger is not so, so bigger. Because 20 times bigger, it just means that the, the size is increased by the cubic squared of 20. So it's not a big deal. It's not so, so bigger. That's the problem of, of atomic modeling, right? You, just, you need to deal with atoms, and you have atoms at each place. So if you double the size, you multiply by eight the number of atoms. Okay. So this is, this is quickly a problem. So this is done by Farid Abraham. He was investigating the crack propagation. So you can see some notch here, another notch there. This is a free surface, another free surface. The atoms are not plotted. The only one that you will see are the ones which are not in perfect position. So they just compute the number of neighbors for each atom. And if they are not uh, consistent with the, the, the perfect lattice, then they are shown. If they are consistent, they are not sh shown. And if you look at what happens, you will see some uh, plasticity out of that, like this. You see the dislocation expanding out of the crack, on the two side cracks. And then you have some dislocation interactions here, here, of course, like that. And if you zoom inside, you will see some junction. You may see some lower lock, some earth, earth lot. You can see uh, sometimes they, they try to, to make a junction and they do not succeed. Here again, you can see the, the junction at some places. It's mo always moving, so it's a, a bit, uh, ooh, I'm ho I hope you are not sick looking at that, but you see some junctions, dislocation junctions. Sometimes you will see some interstitial, some small dislocation moving away. It could be loops, prismatic loops, or interstitial. You have some tetrahedra here formed. You see, this kind of structure is a direct output of the MD simulations. You can see steps at the surface, plastic steps, where the dislocation came out. Okay, So it gives a kind of roughness at the surface. Uh, what else? You can see the junction here. You see, some junction, which is built there also. Stacking fold, small stacking fold. All these things, okay? This is nice. This is nice. It's quite very complicated to analyze. Of course, you see now you have to analyze this. So it's like in TM if you are looking in a forest of dislocations and then you have to investigate what is what is what. So you have to, to make some burgers path everywhere to look at which burgers is this and so on. So it's not easy to analyze. And moreover, this was quite a simple uh, model. I will show you that this MD simulation relies on what we call potentials, interatomic potentials. And this was the simplest one. This was the uh, Leonard Jones potential. So it's not the, the most physical potential. So if you use a, a better potential, you will not be able to have so many atoms because it will be a lot slower to compute. But anyway, this is funny. I would say it's a fancy, this fancy movie. I don't, don't know much what to, to learn out of that, but it's um, something nice, it's, uh, something interesting. So if I, I go further, why do we need uh, molecular dynamics when we are like this, like me? working on dislocation dynamics. It's just because dislocation dynamics, as you, you know, and as I will, I will explain again and again, is based on elastic theory as well. You did with your paperwork last uh, tutorial. You were computing elastic stress field out of the dislocations, and you compute the pitch color force on another dislocations. All these, all these equations are coming from elasticity. Okay? Although you are dealing with plastic things, the dislocation propagate plasticity, the, the, the mathematics, the tensors are elasticity, elastic, and the linear elastic tensors. So in some cases, these linear predictions do not stand. It doesn't work. For example, we saw that close to the dislocation core, you, you see that the dislocation uh, stress is uh, infinite. It's 1 over r. So this is a problem. This is a singularity. So in reality, it could not be infinite, of course. It has to be finite. And it is finite just because there is some core effect which could not be handled by dislocation theory, by elastic theory directly. So there is something which depends on this core here depends only on uh, atomic uh, uh, features. The dislocation mobility also is something that depends on, uh, on, on local <laughs> behavior of your dislocation. So typically, if you look at BCC materials, you, you move a screw dislocation, you will see that one direction is easy, which is the, the twin directions, and one direction is very hard, which is anti-twin directions. And this is just coming from, so this gives a, a non-Schmidt effect. This is just coming from the core of your dislocation. How the core is, is located in your, in your, in your structure gives this asymmetry. In DD, we don't have such an effect, so you will need to add that as a rule, a rule in the code. The junctions may, may, may have also some recombination of the cores, but maybe elasticity could not predict. We have to check every time. The dislocation defect interaction, this is also something where you have all these core recombination. It could be important to have some MD predictions out of that. And finally, 
Another aspect of that is all the, the effect of dislocation nucleation, because in DD we know how to propagate dislocations, multiply with Frank Reed, but we don't know how to introduce new dislocations. This has to be specified in the, in the model. So it could be the case for cracks, for indentation, for grain boundaries. So all those are the places where we need molecular dynamics typically to analyze these uh, studies. So this is the need of MD simulations. So what is MD simulation? So who who do not know anything about molecular dynamics? So you, some of you, so I think this lecture is more for you. <laughs> so please ask me questions. The others, I think, are already using that. So I think I will not uh, learn them a lot of things. So here is the, the simplest way you can see a molecular dynamics. This is what we call the Leonard Jones potent potential. So the movie I just showed before is based on that. So it means that we, we just compute a potential like that, just a, an energy. This energy depends on uh, some parameters, and then you have a power law, a plus term with a power 12, and a minus term to a power 6. So this is decomposed like that. So this is what we call repulsive uh, phenomenological potentials. So it, you can compute that theoretically out of the Pauli principle. Anyway, you can demonstrate this. So this is the, 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 the derivative of this potential will give you the force, the force for which the two, the two atoms want to separate. Okay, This will be a separation force. And then you have the same for the attraction term, like that. This will give you the, the force that wants the two, the two atoms to, to stay together. Okay? And this potential depends on the distance between the atoms, R, like that. So it's, you have a plus and a minus term. So it means that they, they want to attract, they want to repel. So at one time, when this guy will be equal to that guy, it will give the, the static, the equilibrium position of your atoms. It will give you the, the structure, atomic structure. And this is how it looks like. This energy is like this, so there is a minimum like that of this energy. And if you look at the minimum, it will give you, give you the exact, exact position of those, those atoms uh, at equilibrium. Okay? So this is the simplest one you can do. You can do that in your, in, in MATLAB, for example. You can, you can add this formula and you will see how your atoms can, uh, can merge and can stay in a, in a nice lattice. Okay? Now you can have some, some things which are a little bit, uh, Better. So typically we can speak about energetic model. So the energetic models now will take care of a, a system of atoms like this. And we will assume that we compute the energy at a given atoms by the summation of all the pair, uh, in the pair potential. So it means that I take each of the atoms included inside a given sphere, a, a cutoff sphere. I take every atom which are in the sphere and I compute all the interactions with, with these atoms. So this is what is done here. All the atoms inside, I compute the, the local interactions like that. And I add to this energy, to this, to this uh, yes, this energy, I add up the travel, the work, the work I need to apply. So the force times the displacement from the initial position to the new position. So this is the work needed to push your atom. And these two, these two things together gives me my total energy of the system. And again, this has to be minimized in order to, to go to the, to the equilibrium position. Okay. The only parameter here is RC. RC is the size of this uh, domain here which is the, where you take into account these in pair potentials. This typically could be between second and third neighbor, they say, so you, you can take one layer of the first neighbor atoms in the perfect lattice, or three, two layers or three layers of the neighbor. It's typically what people are doing. Of course, the, the more uh, number of layers, when the number of layers is increasing, the longer will be this computation time because of that. Okay. But this is quite easy to make parallel, actually. Uh, the molecular dynamics is easy to, to make parallel because the number of atoms is constant in your box. In, mole in dislocation dynamics, I will show you uh, after the, the break, it's much more complicated because the number of segments or nodes is always increasing. So it's not a, a constant number. So in, in MD simulation, the, the time steps will be always the same. The time needed to, to, to compute a step will be always the same. In DD, it will be slower and slower and slower. And that time, one step a day, you stop your simulation. Okay, so this is the, the biggest difference between MD and DD. Okay, so this is what we call the, the pair potential with the energetic model, when you apply a force like that. So this is the internal energy. We say that this is just due to the in local internal interactions. And this is the applied energy you, you put in your system what do you apply to your box. And this is the pair potentials we just saw before, and this is the reference position, this I explained. Okay? I will give you the slides, of course. Now, from that, many, many improvements have been made, and I think most of you, if you are 
if you are dealing with uh, molecular dynamics, I'm sure you are using this method, right? Who is using AM here? One, two, three, you see, they are all using AM. So this is typically what is used usually for dislocation analysis, embedded atom method, AM. Embedded atom method means that they still get, for this total energy, they still get this, uh, this potential like that, but this potential uh, also depends so the, the force, for example, not, not potential, but the force when you applied your, your dislocation will depend on the, on the electron density uh, surrounding your, your, your atom. So this is what, why they call it embedded atom. So your, your atom is embedded in a, a cloud of electrons, and you need to account for this interaction with the electron fields, electron interactions. So this, of course, is a new function, a row of the distance, but you need to fit, you need to find what how this function is done. By the way, here I didn't say, but this potential also is a fit, is a function with power laws and quite complicated function. So those two functions need first to be identified for each materials you are investigating. And how do you think we can compute the, the values for the parameters of the potentials typically? Do you know which, which model could give that? How can we compute V? Who is speaking? V? DFT, exactly. This will be by density functional theory. So this is done by, by ab initio calculations, okay? And in ability calculation, they will have a hundred of atoms, no more, and they look how they interact. What is the energy if you put a, vac a vacancy inside? So they compute like that, the vacancy energy, interstitial energy, and so on. So they compute all these things, and they, they look at which potential they should put in order to get this. And this is this potential is now introduced in MB. So it's a, already a, a kind of multi-scale modeling. You do some ab initio, you will identify these potentials that you use in, in uh, MD. Nowadays, there exists a lot, a lot of potentials you can find in literature. Many, many potentials for one body, uh, let's say with the same, same atoms types, between nickel, iron, copper, this is done. Now, a lot of pair potentials also exist for two different atoms, uh, copper, aluminum, you see all these things. And for three atoms, it starts also to exist. Now you have some three pair potentials. So all the possible interaction between the three atoms, if this exists also, but so that you can now for example, create a real iron with carb carbon and uh, this kind of things. Iron, carbon, and, uh, and any components, for example, nickel, for example. Okay, so this is uh, the, the state of the art for, for this. This I would advise you to use, and but that atom method is very nice. I will just make you aware of one thing when you are dealing with this, this kind of potentials. Uh, you can change slightly your potential, you can change a small value of your parameters, that will lead to a big consequence on your dislocation mobility, typically. I, will, uh, I know I will not, not show you here this example, but I'm ready to speak about that for BCC, for example. For BCC, depending on the potential you use, you may have a dislocation, a screw dislocation, for which the core could be compact. Compact means that it is a really symmetric core, or it could be dissociated in three, three planes, one, one, all planes. And of course, in reality, only one exists, either compact or de degenerate. So this depends on your potential. And you can, tend, you can take the same potentials, slightly change a little bit of parameters, and you come from this, this core to that core. So you see, this is very, very problematic. So be sure that, that your potential is, is in agreement to what you are looking for. If your, your mechanism you are looking for depends a lot on this core effect, then be sure that you get the right one, okay? For FCC also, it's the same. The potentials may be very good for vacancy uh, energy, for example, but very bad for stacking fault. If you are looking for uh, from constriction or cross fit, the stacking fold is very important. So you need to, pay, to take the potential which gives the right stacking fold energy. So this is what you should uh, should be careful of to, to use the potential because you have many many for a given material you can have five or ten potentials differently. Take the one which gives you the the parameters you want uh, the most in your simulation to be correct. Okay. One more uh, one more type of uh, potential is given there. This one is, a, let's say, an extension is the, the most complicated you can use. Maybe they are more complicated, but for me, it would be the... I'm not an expert of MD, by the way. You know that I'm dislocation dynamics. I'm just, I'm just uh, using a little bit of this thing, but not more. So this one here is where, when you take also into account not only pair potential, but also some angular phenomenon. It could be the case of magnetic uh, materials, for example. In that case, you need to have... The, uh, it's not a, a central symmetric interaction. So if you have two atoms here, it depends of the angle between these, these atoms. Okay, the, the angles also play a role. So in that case, you need to adopt again a new function, a new omega term, which depends on angle theta, and this this also is a new parameter to fit out of uh, DFT calculations. Okay, 
So the fitting parameters is given here, cohesion energy, lattice parameters, elastic constant, stacking point energy. All these are the parameters people from ab initial try to, uh, to match because these values are available experimentally. So they want to they fit their potential to match these, uh, these parameters. Okay? So this is how it works. So now let's assume that you've got a, a potential. So you, you can run the DD simulations. How can you run DD simulations? Um, no, DD MD simulation. First, you can compute the force on each atom. The force will be the opposite of the derivative, the gradient of the energy, in order to minimize the energy. Okay? So this is how it's done. So either you do static simulation. Static means that you don't have time. You don't take into account time. You are just looking for the minimum of the energy. So you put zero force, like that. And you look for the, the best uh, um, atom structure that will minimize your energy. So you start with a complicated structure, and they will relax. We call it a relaxation stage, actually, in order to, to be the lowest energy uh, configuration. This is typically what you should do if you introduce a dislocation in your, sim in your simulation box. Usually, we put the, st the displacement field. So you take a perfect uh, crystal. You remove an extra half pen, or you, you, you put your dislocation there. And then, to put your dislocation, you, you add also some displacement field corresponding to your dislocation, so the burgers vector, which is translated one part of the, the, the space compared to the bottom one. You put this field, so it will distort your, your lattice. And then, first, you need to relax, so that you will see the core splitting. You will see your dislocation core splitting created. And this now is a, is a physical start for your simulation. Okay? Don't put your dislocation and start your simulation straight after, because you will have some artifact. Okay, the beginning will just be this relaxation stage. It's not what you are looking for. So this is always starting like, starting like that. First, you need to have a static simulation to be sure that you have something which is physically uh, co correct. And then you can also do dynamic simulations. You just use the, the Newton equation. So the sum of the, the force is equal m gamma, ac the acceleration rate, like that. So now you have the time enter into play, the time. So you need to compute the, the here you have the acceleration. Out of it, we can compute the force. And then we can uh, compute the displacement, the displacement of the atom, what is the new position of atoms. And usually for that, we use a Verlet algorithm, Verlet algorithm with a time step, which, is, which has to be very small. And the reason for that is just the physical reason. It's just because it has to be smaller than the Debye frequency. And the Debye frequency is 10 to minus 13. If you want to account for this, your time step has to be lower than that. And this, is explain, this explains why the, the time step of MD is 10 minus 15. The femtosecond comes from this, and you cannot go bigger. If you go bigger, then you will not have the, the, the right physics. So you don't say that I will make a bigger time step, as some people could do for DD or whatever. It will not work here, and not, at least not for dynamic. OK? Then here I put also that this is limited simulations. Just because of this time step, which is so, 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 so small, you will never be able to, to look at diffusion mechanism because diffusion will take something like seconds. So seconds in the computer, and if you have one, one million atoms, you, you can wait uh, all your PhD, I think, for one simulation. <laughs> so it's not something we... If you want to look at diffusion, it's better to use Monte Carlo or some, uh, some uh, other me method. Okay. Now let's look at, at a typical application. So this is a box. This is a box like that, containing all the atoms. So all the atoms are visible here. The colors, I will show, explain better, later the colors. So let's, let's wait a bit. The, I will use embedded atom method with this potential and with the density, uh, density function here. I will solve in, in dynamic, dynamic like that. My time step will be the femtosecond for the reason I explained. And I will simulate 10 minus 9, so one, uh, one million steps in the box. This is typically what we, we do. So now we, to visualize this, the, no, first thing, the number of atoms involved here, if you have 50 nanometers per size, which is not the case here, you see it's not a cubic, but it's similar, it means that you have 8 million atoms, so typically. So 8 million atoms, if you want to do 1 million steps, you need a parallel computer. But the parallel computing is quite, uh, quite available everywhere nowadays with GPU cards, with this kind of things, you can easily make your uh, use parallel code. And the codes which are available, I didn't say anything about codes, but I think that most of you are, are using LAMPs, I guess. LAMPs or Abinit or this kind of thing. Not Abinit, it's for Abinitio. There is another one, I think, than LAMPs. Uh, which one? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So those are the two most known uh, uh, MD codes. So the LAMPs, I think, is very famous now because it's highly parallel and, and quite easy to, uh, to handle. So this is parallel, so you can use it in your cluster or your favorite uh, parallel machine. 
And to visualize this location, of course, you cannot do this because then you will see nothing. So first, you need to, to think about a technique to, to visualize these locations. And uh, there are several, several techniques which exist. Uh, they are all based on the neighboring counting. So you count your neighbor of your segments. And depending if you, you, you count number of neighbors and you highlight the colors, or you can go back to the perfect materials and see if they are in exact position. Those are mainly the two, the two ways to, to show, to show these locations. And you put colors, and the colors is different depending on how many neighbors are not correct, let's say. So this is typically a, a dislocation, you see, which is dissociated in two partials. You have the stacking fold between leading and tail partials are there. Okay? So this is what, how we analyze, uh, this is a typical simulation is this. This time step, this amount, this size. So the, then this is one example. Here this was static. So I already showed that, so just to remind you, uh, to refresh your mind of what we, we show. If I put two dislocation junctions that want to form a, 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 a lomer cotrel log, like that. So this is the lomer cotrel log. You know how it works. We did it analytically. We did it in the, I showed you for the line tension model and DD model. And for MD simulation, this is what you get. You have exactly the same, the same, um, shape, form, of course. And actually, I would say that even this is more, more accurate than that. Theoretically, this is more the, the solution. So that's static simulation. That's the first example. And this is typically the starting point of a multi-scale modeling. If we, we want to have a multi-scale modeling of uh, hardening, it will start from this junction at the atomic level. It will go for this location inside forest hardening to get the alpha coefficient yesterday. And it will go up to the dislocation density model I showed you yesterday. This is the three stages of, of hardening, starting from a, a single dislocation, ending to the dislocation density evolution law, typically. Okay. Let's uh, show you now uh, one or two examples, I think two, two examples of how uh, information from the molecular dynamics are transferred to dislocation dynamics. How can we feed DD code out of uh, MD uh, uh, data? Okay. So I will show for that, uh, this, the first illustration comes from uh, irradiation problematic. So this is the case of uh, uh, RPV, so reactor pressure vessel, like that. Reactor pressure vessel is here. This was part of a European project. I was, I was part of it. So in that project, they were looking at all the effect of irradiation or the mechanical properties of those different materials. So typically, you have three main materials which are sensible, which are very um, sensitive, I would say, in this uh, device. First is the zircon zirconium, which is uh, con containing the, the uranium in the, in the, we call it crayon. I don't know how you call this, the, the coils, the fuel coils, yes, exactly. So this is the zirconium. I will show you an application of zirconium later on, if you want. Yeah, there is also this shield here, which are made of austenitic steels. So this is just to, to, to protect a bit the, the vessel. And then the vessel is made of benetic steels on the outside. So mostly this is FCC materials. It's stainless steel, so it's typically 316L stainless steel, FCC materials. And this is a benetic steel, so it's made of ferrite and, uh, and matricite. So this is a, a composite materials. And most of the matrix is, is BCC. Okay. So this is two, two very interesting materials for DD simulations to investigate. So if you look now at this um, irradiated materials, this is how it looks like. So, for example, in copper, we have this stacking fault tetrahedral. I already showed you, explained you uh, previously, that this could happen as a nucleation in the material because of the cascade they form. So these are made of vacancies, usually, in copper. So this is a tetrahedral. You remember, it was a Frank loops which formed and then which uh, expand into a tetrahedral. So we see like this. So this was done in copper. Of course, this, there is no copper in uh, your power plants. But now if you look at the micrometer scale, so this was a stainless steel, you can see that you have many, many defects everywhere. But at some places, and this is very bad for the material, you have a clear band. We call it a clear channel or clear band where the defects have been removed. And this is very bad for the, for the material. Why, why do you think this is bad? You have an idea what, why, why this, uh, this clear band will be, ne uh, will be nefast to the material. It will, be, uh, it, will, uh, it will decrease a lot the life of the material. Why? Maybe I'm going too fast. Maybe if, if I put a dislocation here, because of this uh, uh, defect like that, the dislocation will be... Do you think it will be easy to move the dislocation or not here? It will be very hard because it will be pinned by all these obstacles. So the dislocation will be immobile. So this macroscopic, macroscopically will give you a high yield stress. So that's good for the material. We love materials with high, st uh, high stress. So so it means that irradiation is good 
for your, your strength of material. Good. But if this happens, it's no more good because now if a dislocation comes here, it will be easy. It's like a highway for dislocation. And this highway for dislocation leads to these big steps that you can see here. It will localize plasticity. Many, many dislocations will go there because it's very easy. I told you they are lazy guys. So as soon as they see a highway, they take it. And it's a free highway. So it's very, very cheap for them to, to take it. So they take the highway and then this localized deformation is steps. And plastic localization is very bad. It will create a crack and your material is dead. Okay. So this is why this is nefast. Okay. It could be good, but then if you have this plastic deformation, you are dead. So this is why people are interested in. So macroscopically, I already said, but this is how it looks like. So this was all copper, by the way. It was not stainless steel. This was all copper. But same thing I will show you is for, for stainless steel. So this is the normal copper with a huge hardening because of forest hardening. This is typo, typical of copper. You can see that this is not a stage one, stage two, stage three curve. So it means that it is multi-slip. This is typical of a polycrystalline material. If you have many, many grains, then you will not never have a stage one because you will always need two systems to activate. And you, because of the averaging over all the grains, you always start in multiple multi-slip. So this is typical of a polycrystalline sample, stage two and then recovery mechanism. And then this is the, the maximum elongation, which is up to 50%, which is it's quite a ductile material. Now, if you, you put some uh, displacement per atom, so a few, a few doses here, you increase a lot your yield stress by a factor four, something like that, you see. So now you have very strong material. A small hardening uh, remains, but then the, the ductility decreases. You have shrinked your ductility. So your material is, because of this, okay, material is less good. And if you, if you put even more irradiation, you increase again more the, the stress, and now you have a softening mechanism. Directly, you don't have hardening anymore. So this is very, very bad, because just imagine for one reason here, you exceed a little bit your stress, you break directly. So this is bad. You, there is no stability. You see, Here, at least, you have a few stability, so you can sustain more load. It will be ductile. Here, it's totally brittle, so it's something which is unstable. Our material is... Uh, is very bad for application like this. Okay. These are, this will lead to shear bands, exactly, exactly. This uh, clear channel will, uh, will correspond to the shear bands, like that, we, that will localize plasticity. I will show you this now in, in detail. So this was for copper. Now I will go for the real uh, material that is interesting for uh, power plants, typically the stainless steel. So stainless steel, we can do the same analysis. analysis. You can see a lot, of, a lot of defects. Those are the, the defects in this uh, irradiated stainless steel. So this was irradiated by, uh, by ions, krypton ions, like that. So we'll, I will show you a, a study where we, it will involve MT, TM simulation, where you can see the channels here, like that. We will look at molecular dynamics, because this is the topic of my, my lecture, how dislocation react with locally with each of the defects. So it means that this simulation you see here is just a tiny simulation of what is happening at that point, you see. Just have an idea of this zooming uh, Things you see, this is 10 nanometers, this is 0.5 microns. This size here is just one, one interaction there. Okay? So this is what we do with, uh, we do, you should always have this in mind when you do MD simulation. You are just looking at a small, tiny event in a very big uh, sample compared to reality. So we'll look at that. And then we'll go further. I will introduce what happens this to a higher scale model, which will be higher, typically comparable to the, to the TM, where you will put these locations everywhere and see the multiplication. And our guess is using DD to explain this phenomenon, how the clear band forms and uh, how they expand and so on, okay? So this was part of the European project. So let's focus on the TM first. So first, what is the, 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 the defect in stainless steel? So the defects are like that. You can see this is the thin foil. I think uh, you, 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 sh you could explain better than me, but these fringes you could see here is just because of the thickness of your thin foil. If you look, your thin foil is usually, uh, there is a hole, and you are looking close to the hole. So locally, you have something which is thicker and thicker. And this gives this pattern that you have here, because of the thickness. I think you call it thickness fringes or something like that, no? Yes. In 2B conditions, okay. Yeah. Wedge shape, exactly. So this is why you have this. So this is not a defect, okay? So the, the white lines here are just because of the thickness. It's a kind of aberration, I would say, of the, in the picture. So this was the condition at which this was observed. So irradiated at 350 degrees with this uh, uh, ion, xenon ion. It was not krypton, it was xenon, at that energy. 
up to two to five displacement per atoms. And if you have this amount of, um, of displacement, you can, you can, by calculation with um, cascade uh, simulations, assume that you, you, you've got irradiation up to five, seven microns in depth. Okay? So that's the data. So you, of course, you don't, don't have irradiation everywhere. And this is not neutron irradiation, because neutron irradiation, as you know, the material will be activated. And because of that, you need to go in what we call a hot cell, a hot lab, because you need to be protected to look at that. So it's much more complicated. Some, some exist. I think in Calpacam, there, is, there are some studies on, on irradiated materials in the hot cell device. In France also, there, there are a few. But those experiments are very, very expensive because you need to have this, all this, uh, this specific equipment to, to handle that. So this is non-activated materials because of the xenon. And we observe that with the right hour, oh, here's some loops. Those loops are frank loops, so one, one, one type uh, loops. The size is about 6 to 10 nanometers, and the density, so the number of loops per, per, per volume, is 10 to the 22. It's huge density. You have many, many, many loops. This is good for molecular dynamics. If you have large densities, it means that in your small, small box of atoms, you can put some of them. It, it will be realistic. If it was a low density, MD would be dead, because you put one atom, you should take a big, big, big box to, to have the, 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 the quantity then you cannot do that with MD. Okay. So this is good for MD to have a large density. So it's a good exercise. Now, the, how was done this? It was a backside electropolition. I, I, I mean that this is, was irradiated on the top, up to 7 microns. We want to keep this. We want to look at that effect. So they want, the, the specimen was uh, elec electropolished from the back. So that we keep the surface up to it was thin. And then we look through the specimen. This is a technique for TM to, to do that. It's a backside electropolishing. Okay. Now, if we look at TM and SEM at the same place, this is the TM and this is the SEM of the surface in front of it. You can see that in TM you have some, uh, in dark field, you can see some uh, clear channels. Clear channels are, are clearly visible. And at the surface, using the, the FEG, so it's um, a focused uh, electron gun with the SEM, scanning electron microscope, you can see some, uh, some relief at the surface. This is a relief. It means it's like extrusion or intrusion. It means that here, you indeed have a large deformation localized in that bonds. And they are more or less in front of the clear bonds inside the material. Okay. So it means that what I said is true. It means that in that uh, highway, many dislocations came and they, they, they create steps at the surface. So there is a strain localization. Here. This is the evidence of strain localization. Okay. So the straining was done after irradiation. So it means first we irradiate, then we pull on it. We pull on it at this uh, deformation, at this velocity and this temperature. So it's a irradiation then deformation mechanism, okay? This is what happens more or less in reality. In reality, when you have your, if you have stainless steel, which are, for example, uh, used for the, the screw, for example, to attach your, your sheet, your, in your material, then there is uh, some force when you, you, you have, uh, you have, uh, I don't know how you say, when you have, when you put your screw like this, you put some force inside. So if there is a, a, an internal force that you apply, your dislocation, your material is now irradiated. So this force uh, is applied on your dislocations and your irradiation defects. So this can, can create some plasticity. And then, indeed, this creates plasticity. And sometimes you can see that these uh, screws are, are broken after a few months of, of service. It could be broken just because of this uh, localization. Okay. So this is really something which is important. Now, if we zoom in the material, like this, we can see the bonds. This is the clear bonds. You can see another one here, which are the, the width is about 20, 18 nanometers, the thickness of this. And you have many, many bonds, and the distance between two bonds is about one to three microns. Okay. So this is what we observed. Like this. And if we zoom in a bond, now if we zoom on dislocations themselves, you see that dislocations are not nice curves, as I showed you. It's not a frank root source. They are heavily jogged. You see, they are like that. There are many zigzags on the same dislocation, you see. You can see that they are not uh, happy. Those dislocations are totally, uh, they should be like that. They should be like this. this is in the case of non-deformed material, you have some straight lines. They are not like that. And just because they react with the defect, they are just totally impeached by the defect, and there is some things which happen, and we'll see what, what it is. Okay? So let's go to MD to have an idea of the local uh, possibilities for dislocation to react with these defects. For that, so this was done by, by my colleague uh, David Rodney, David Rodney here, who wrote this paper, and we had a common PhD student, Thomas Nogaret here. 
So the idea here first was to look at all the possible interactions between the dislocations and the uh, Frank loops. So the Frank loops is in a one-on-one -on -one plane. I showed you it's a one-on-one -on -one plane with the Burgers vector one-on-one, -on -one, so a faulted loop. And you have to put an edge or a screw dislocation. So you already have two possibilities, edge or screw, which is here. Edge, edge or screw. S is screw, edge is, is here. And then now the, the loop here could be in any of the one-on-one -on -one plane. This will be in the one-on-one -on -one plane. So you have four possibilities for the, this loop to be put in this horizontal plane, because we don't look at it. This plane, this plane, or this plane. So you have three planes here to locate your loop. So this makes a lot of possibilities. Edge, screw, three planes. Okay? So this is all what we investigated here. So all the possibilities, so some are called wedge minus, wedge plus, and cross flip. So those are the three planes. And then you have some reaction that I will show you, which that we observe. Some are called R4, reaction 4, reaction 1, reaction 3. Uh, there is no reaction 2, by the way. I don't remember what was reaction 2 in the PhD, but I'm sure there was something like that. <laughs> That will be a, a typical interaction mechanism. So I will show you those mechanisms now. Okay? Do you do you, want, do you want get the, the ID of the simulation? So this is how it looks like. This is what I explained. So you have either a screw collinear to the burger vector or an edge like that. You put your Thompson tetrahedra and you locate your Frank loops in one of the planes here, P1, P3, or P2, which was behind. Okay? You apply this uh, stress rate. So you increase the stress continuously to be sure that your dislocation pass through the obstacle, and we see what happens. You can put one or two dislocations to, to look at that. Uh, so the, the loops are just hexagonal. They are hexagonal, by the way, in this case, but with the, the corners is like edge components, according to some observation by Japanese guys. The diameter is this, it's the temperature. And here is a, something which may be nasty. We didn't use a stainless steel potential. This doesn't exist. Stainless steel is a, an alloy. So you have carbon, you have nickel, you have a very complicated steel. So we took something which has the closest stacking fault energy. Because we, we assume that the stacking fault energy is the key parameter here for this modeling. Because it will, it will um, take care of all the partial splitting, recombination, and so on. So we take a copper, which has a, a wrong stacking fault energy for copper, a too low one. So it was close, actually, to the stainless steel. So you see the trick? We just took a wrong potential for copper, which was good for stainless steel. You see, by it or not, this is what we did. <laughs> okay, and the box size is given here. So this is typically the box size. No, let's speak about the boundary condition. So boundary conditions, the dislocation will move, and it will be periodic. So when it is going away here, it will re-enter the opposite way. The top and bottom surface are free surface, and we apply a shear along the burgers vector like that. Okay, to move the either the edge or the screw. Is it clear for the Modeling. So those are the three reactions we see. Reaction one, two, or, so the two was the same. Okay, one, two, three, or four. So I will I will show each of them so that you will have some movie. Now it's movie time, movie break. <laughs> so first reaction, let's have a look at this guy. So this guy is an edge. So we we have an edge dislocation incoming. Okay, and you have the Frank loop in a given plane, and you see the movie. So this is the movie. Your dislocation comes, react with the loop, and what happened? Nothing happened. <laughs> That's very dis disespering. You see, you, you, you are looking for hardening mechanism, and here there is no hardening mechanism, like if there was no loop, actually. There is nothing. In this typical case, I will run it again. This, this typical case, it's like a very weak interaction. It's like if there is no defect. The dislocation, the loop is insensitive to this, uh, this uh, burger vector of this edge. This is just because of the local reaction. If you look when this tray, a uh, head partial meet that guys. They don't want to create stair rod or whatever, but it's very highly possible that they create a perfect burgers vector in the plane that will very easily recover. So it's the, the, the destruction pass through. The, the loop is shielded, but very quickly it can glide and, and rebuild as it was. So it, there is no, no change. The destruction loop is still there. There is no pinning make force on the loop. There is nothing. Okay? Yes, this is the front loop. So it's exactly in irradiated FCC. We, we very frequently see that the loops are hexagonal. Yeah, hexagonal loops with the 111 burgers vector. It's a frank loop, so it's faulted. This one is sessile, it cannot move. It will just move if, uh, if uh, it becomes glissile. This is not the case here. And so it's a sessile loop that will not move, only that one can move. Okay? And we can see that you have the, the double stacking fault here. Remember that it was like a double stacking fault, these uh, this frank loops. Oops, oh, no, I should not do that. Okay? So let's go back. So here, nothing happened. 
So it was rose constructed after the first step. So the step is created and totally removed. And this was, uh, we changed the temperature, we, we changed many, many things. It was, this was a PhD, so it was three years study, but I will try to sum up here. So we investigate many, many, many uh, parameters. So if the temperature decreases, and if you increase the, the stress rate, it was even uh, more frequently that we observed that. So the, 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 the strength of this is weak, there is no strength. Let's go at that one now, and you see that this is a bit different. You can have an idea of the result. It's still an edge, but not with the same loop. So this is the, 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 the here, here you have the dislocation edge. You have your front loop in the inclined plane now, not parallel plane, but inclined one. And if you look at the movie, the dislocation edge comes. There is a local reaction here that will unfold the loop. The loop is unfolded partially. And there is a jog on your edge dislocation. Now the dislocation is no more planar. There is some out of plan, plane uh, segments. And the part of the loop has been removed. So this is a, a, a cleaning process, actually. You have removed the part of your defect. So as if you are just sweeping a bit your defect, you remove some of them. So you are starting to build a, a, a clear bound. Very, but very small. You just remove a small part of the loop. Okay. But at least it is one possibility to absorb a loop. Okay. And the dislocation is now no more planar, but it can glide. So it means that here somewhere, this point here corresponds to that point. This point corresponds to that point. Here, I think this, this job will move along the burger's vector. Uh, corresponding to the reaction between the two. So it is pinned in a line. This can only glide in a, in a line. You can see the movie again. But it's not very really much hardening. The hardening is very weak again. You can see that the solution is not much bent. And it can pass through quite easily, like that, and move away. Okay? That's a, a, a small, let's say, um, mechanism to, to remove the density of loops. The third one now, so this is con concluded here. I will not uh, comment more. The third one is the case of the screw. Now I put a screw dislocation coming in, in contact with uh, the loops, and I will see how it works. So for that, we just put uh, two, two loops. So you have two loops, one here and one there, just for periodic boundary conditions uh, to be enforced. You see that the dislocation loops react, the dislocation line reacts with the loops, and then what does it form here? A perfect dislocation. It is unfolded now, you see? But the dislocation has unfolded the loops. You saw the reaction, I can show again. So you had two sessile dislocations that were one-on-one -on -one loops, like this, both cannot move. Dislocation comes, you can make the, you can play with the partial vectors and you will see that just because of the local recombination, you are able to form a perfect dislocation line, which is like a prismatic loop. This is a prismatic loop, actually, actually this, with the burger's vector, which is like that. These are two prismatic loops, which are generated because of unfolding of the front loops. Okay? And if you look at the same view, from a, the same movie from another view. Well, this is the same movie. Let's, let's have a, a, a last view of the movie. So we, you can see that this dislocation is now no more planar. It's an helical dislocation. It makes some, when it comes away, it will be flattened. But at the beginning, it's an helical dislocation like that. And then it, it, it escapes. It's the stacking fault of your screw dislocation. If I go, I, I look at that. Ah, like this. So here, the movie highlights the fact that initially your dislocation was at that position here. It was introduced here. And you see that when it escaped from the, the pinning point, it's no more in the same plane. The dislocation was there, it reacts, and then it was uh, freed in that plane, which is not at the same height. I can play the movie again to be sure that you see. Initially, the dislocation is, is here. It reacts with the loops. It's quite complicated. It's an helical term, a double helical term. It forms the, the two prismatic loops, and it is emitted a new dislocation in a, a new plane. Okay, so it means that your dislocation reacts and comes up in another plane. It, and if later on there is another loop, it will react and come in another plane again. So that way, the dislocation is no more in, uh, gliding in a plane; it is always moving up and up, like if it was taking a, an elevator. Okay, so this is, has an effect of elevator in the in the in the deformation mechanism. Like this, and of course, this now could be strong pinning because of that. You have it's very hard to detach your dislocation. So this is the main hardening mechanism in, if you know, in your material. This is very weak, and this is very hard. Okay. So let's now go further. We can go to DD and we say, okay, let's introduce what we learned from MD into a DD code to see at the effect of many, many thousands of defects and and many dislocations things that we could not do with uh, MD. 
So we'll look at clear bound formation now out of DD simulations. So this is what we do in DD. First, we put some prismatic loops. So the, the prismatic loops in DD, I showed you, it's just, it will not be uh, hexagonal, it will be this shape. So the edge part, the burger's vector is coming out of the, of the table. So this is the prismatic loops as I explained before. Okay, those are supposed to be immobile as if they were faulted. In my DD code here, I don't have stacking fault, I don't have partial, it's my stupid uh, 3D code. So this one is very easy. So I would say they, they could not move. Artificially, I say you can't move. Okay, velocity is zero. And I, I give to the, to the loop the burger's vector of the incoming dislocation. I will look at the effect with a single dislocation coming in. But they just, they are just immobile. So now I define two rules. So this is my loop. You see the loop is there, here. This is the loop with the burger's vector perpendicular. So this is the prismatic loop. It is sessile, you cannot move. If a dislocation comes in the vicinity of the loop, so this is my edge screw model, I will explain after the break. So it's made of screw and edge and screw and edge segments. So this is an edge segment, this is a screw segment. So if this segment is more like a screw, so to compute that, I just compute the average line, the tangent to the line, and if it's smaller than 20 degrees, I assume that this is a screw. I don't take the pure screw, I take some, some, uh, some error bar between, so between minus 20 and plus 20 degrees, I assume that this is a, a screw, more than an edge part. So if this is a screw, then I say, okay, here I will apply the screw rule. So I, this is what I will say. I will say, oh, it's, it's written here. I say that now the loop is free to move. It's like if it's a, a perfect prismatic loop, like what we saw in MD, it's unfolded. So I, I mean that now the loop is unfolded, and let's do what it wants. So it will react, it will create the, the, the spiral, the, the helicopter automatically. I can show you the, the movie, I think it's there. I think I had the movie here. Activate two. So this is what happens. You have your dislocation you will see incoming. Here I put three loops. Up they are freed. When they are grazed, they are pinned. And when they are freed, you see they can move and react with my DD code. And this creates my helical turns and it can escape. This looks very much similar to what we saw with MD. Okay, this small rule I put. I, I, I take them as sessile, and when this uh, screw comes into contact, I said, no, now you are, you are free to move. We are free to move and then they can reconnect. The colors here indicates which planes they are gliding on. So this is a crossly plane and this is a primary plane. So you have the, this is clearly something which is out of plane. And here you can see the a kind of job which looks like a prismatic loop in 3D. So you have a, a zoo like this and, and like this. So you have a double and equal term. Okay. So this is for the, the screw. For the edge, I do something different. I said the edge, are, there is a strength for the edge. We saw that there is a strength which was quite weak, a weak strength. So to do that, we say, okay, if now the, screw, the dislocation is here, this is the prismatic loop, another one is here, another one is here. We say when the edge part comes into contact with the loop, I will, I will do nothing. The, 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 the loop will still be a, a faulted loop, it will not move. I will just pin a bit my dislocations up to the moment when this angle, what we call phi c, the critical angle, is small enough. If this guy is too small, it means that it is strength, it is a hard uh, obstacle when this is small. And for a given value of phi c, I will free my dislocation. So there is a critical pinning point, pinning stress, and we, uh, we measure the, the angle at which it will free the dislocation in order to match with the MD simulations. And we found that this should be about 100 degrees. So this is what we, we put in the code. I will show you the, the movie. So this now is an edge. It is pinned by the loops like that. And it tries to unpin. And when this angle is equal to 100 degrees, it is freed like that. Of course, this leaves a small over one loop, a small over one loop which is surrounding the, the prismatic loop. OK? You get it? So those are the two mechanisms I put in my DD code. This is what I call local rules. Many times you, you heard me this, uh, t t t saying something like local rule. This is for me a local rule. I put in my code this rule and that rule. Okay? It's, um, it's artificial, but we, we can't do better because uh, DD could not predict this. Okay, so let's go now. Um, one, one small comment here, which I think is interesting for you. You observe that what I did here was very small scale. It was uh, 10 nanometers. So this is something which is theoretically forbidden. But we should not use elastic theory to look at such tiny details which are lower than, the, you see, a few nanometers. That means that my dislocation is, is described in few segments. Maybe some of the segments are less than one burgers. 
So this is out of elastic theory. Elastic theory is, is available at a given distance from the core of the dislocation, typically a, a hundred burgers vector or this kind of thing. Here we are much smaller than that. But even though you can see that these mechanisms are, are respected. This is for me very surprising. When I, I did that, you say, oh, that's a good surprise. It means that elasticity is very much robust. Even at this tiny scale, elasticity is, is valid. I don't know exactly why, but I mean that it's just because elasticity is, is the, the most important mechanism. So even locally at such a small scale, you can use elasticity. You have the key uh, mechanism. This is what I, I wanted to highlight here. Because in the past, people said, no, at DD simulation, you, you cannot use at the small scale. You have to use a big scale. No, it's no more true now. We know that this is, you can use it at that scale. So this is now one example. I don't want to show you many, many uh, examples. Again, this, I told you that this was a PhD. So here I look at the, at the big simulation with many, many loops. When they are great, means that they are sessile. They cannot move. I put a source here, which was coming inside. It was emitting loops inside. And you see that now when they, they reacted with the, the, the defects, some have been freed, so they have colored now. So some dislocation came here and up and there and that place. Some are coming here and there. Some are here and some are there. So dislocation reacted. And here you have the, the beginning of the clear bond. You see that here the, the defect has been, has been all removed just because of this local reaction with the, with the loop. I don't have the movie. I had the movie, but I was not able to to find the movie, but I show you the, some analysis of the pictures. If you now look at it on, from the top, not from the middle, but from the top, you see that this was the place where I put my dislocation source. What you can see is that the first dislocation that came into the, 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 the material is heavily jogged. You have many chain of planes. The chain of colors is the chain of planes, okay, like that. And this dislocation is more or less dead. You cannot move forward. It is pinned because of all these jogs. A new dislocation here is pushing because of the pile of stress. It is pushing a little bit your dislocation. You say, okay, go further, go further. It's, it's like a, it's like a team. They want to, to penetrate the, the, the sample like that. And here you can see that those are not jogged at all just because the, the zone here is free. There is no more defect here. So this is like a perfect dislocation that can move fast and generate some stress that will push more your dislocation. And that way it will invade the, the material, sweeping the defect to the border. You see the defect are now all on the side. And then that way it will clean up, clean up, clean up, clean up the, the channel. You see? And if you, oh, this is what I explained. And if you look on the, on the, on the side, if you make a zoom on only this area, this is what I, I, I define. We define that we have what we call pushing dislocations, those three here. They are just pushing fast like this with their internal stress. They make a stress to that guy, that guy. Those are dislocations which are totally dead because they are pinned like this and they are out of the plane. And this guy is the cleaning one, which is still reacting with the, the dislocation. Those are the workers. You see, they clean, they clean. And the guys, they push it. This is the boss. He said, please do the job. And the, the guys are, are doing the job, you know. <laughs> this is how it works. So this is the team, a team, uh, team work. And last comment, because of the fact that when it reacts, the screw reacts with the front loops, it will be emitted in another plane. You see that the, the, the channel is always going toward a given direction. So you have something which is thickening in one direction only, not on the two sides, more on the, on the up part. Okay, this is just because of this uh, elevator mechanism I explained. So the DD reproduces that very well. And then, finally, just to conclude, this compares very well with experiments. This is what we found, and this is the, a typical observation in, uh, in literature. This is the only, only observation in TM, because TM, TM experimentalists are nice guys, as you know, but uh, it's very hard for them to, to be able to, uh, you see, oh shit, I should go there, to be able to, uh, for when you have such a, a thing like that, they should be able to have a thin foil which is exactly in the clear channel. So they should be able to cut it in the plane. This is very rare. It's very difficult to orient it their thin foil so that it, this is the one-on-one -on -one plane, this is the, the clear channel, and to visualize exactly the clear channel. Usually what they have is what I showed you before. They have something which is inclined, so they just see a clear band. They don't, they are not in the band, they, are, they see the band on, on, on the side, like that. Here, this is the only picture I, I know where they, they were successful to, to see inside the band. So here the effect on top and bottom, the bottom have been removed, and you, you see what happened inside the, the clear band. And inside the clear band, they see some, uh, see the burger's vector, they see a lot of screw dislocation like that, and a lot of debris on the side. Exactly what I found, this is my screw dislocation, the debris are there. This heavy job dislocation corresponds to, I don't know why, maybe that was here, maybe it's on the opposite side. 
and this is a clear dislocation which are coming in the bond. What's the? The breeze? The breeze? I don't get Yes? Oh, the debris, yeah, the debris on the side is just the reaction, what I showed you here before, actually. You see, the debris which are here on the top and bottom is just because of when, when dislocation reacts with it. Maybe, yes, that's true, but I didn't highlight that much. I, I can show it more on the, yes, I removed the, the, the part, I should say it more, but maybe, maybe here, yeah, on that movie, I think we, we can see the mechanism. See, when you have the screw, the screw coming, like this, it will react with the defect, and then this creates a perfect dislocation, but will move on the right and the left. You see that this guy will now be, now be extended and moves on the right, and moves on the left. So the defect has always, are always pushed along the burger's vector, either on the right or on the left, depending on what you put. Okay, so this is why you have this defect, which are always, they take it and they push it away, they take it, they push it away. Okay, this is how it works. Okay, for this, uh, this thing, So it's, I think it's time, but uh, it's, I, I think uh, it's one hour. So I, I had this, uh, this, uh, this one. I think I will, I will explain maybe after the break. We are, I already showed you some of this uh, simulation of nano indentation. That's another application where MD could help DD. I think I need to, to show you that, but maybe I will do that after the break, okay? Because it's one hour, and I won't, don't want to change. So maybe let's, let's stop here, and if you have questions, please ask me questions regarding the, this first... Uh, Mm -hmm. Shear bond, yes. Shear bond is, is, here we are inside the bond. We are inside the bond. So if we look on the top, you would see some clear channel from here, you will see a bond. The, the thickness here is when you see from the side. See, this is from the top and this is from the side. This is the, the bond. In, in a TM, you would see some clear channel here. Of course, it's not uh, full. Actually, we, we started again this study more recently where we looked at the effect of multiple bonds in the simulation, so we were able to put more, more bonds and see how they interact. This was done by an Indian student from Kalpakam, by the way, Gouraj Kadiri. We did it with him. Yes, exactly. So here you are, you are, you are building up some free zone where the locations are easy to move. And because of, the, of this, this is the highway, we are, we are starting, just the starting process here, I, of course, I don't have a big one. This is something like a week simulation, okay, it takes a week to compute. And after a week, we have such a, a thing, okay. But if you, you compute two weeks or one month, you get something bigger and bigger, okay. Yes? Yes, here we took the same as the, as the incoming dislocation. So the, here you had the screw dislocation with these burgers there. Uh, why, why did I put incline one? What is this? Uh, the burger vector is here. I don't know why I put this uh, B here. I don't know what does it mean. Oh no, it was just a highlight thing. Don't, this is not B. B is like that. This is a screw. This is a screw dislocation, okay? And the loops, you can see, they are all perpendicular to B. So it's prismatic loops, which are already ready to, because I, I don't have all the possibilities in my DD code to change the burger vector, to react, to create with the partials. So I already put them ready to react with the same burger vector, okay? But they are sessile. They are sessile, and only if a screw comes, they will be freed, and then they can reconnect. This is the local rules I, I introduced, okay? So I know that this is artificial, I agree. But this is taken out from the MD modeling. In MD, I saw that any B I put, when it is unfolded, the new B will be the one of the incoming dislocation. So here, I already put the one of the incoming dislocation. Okay, so it's a artificial introduced, but this mimic what we found with MD. Okay. They are not frank loops, no. No, they are artificial frank loops. They are just immobile. Exactly. They, they are just, uh, I go back to here, they are just pure prismatic loops, but sessile. So artificially pinned, ready to be unpinned. Okay. So it's like if they were unfolded by the loop already, by the destruction already, but not moving yet. And then we let them move and see what they, they do. Okay. I think that was a, a nice uh, study from MD that uh, was useful for DD. If we didn't have the MD, we could not do this DD analysis, okay? So I show you that MD is important for, for DD guys. You had a question, yeah? Hmm? Yes, good point. So I will show this uh, tomorrow for the, 
Yeah, because here today I, will, I, I don't show that. Actually, now uh, Wei Tsai, his name is Wei Kai or Wei Tsai from, from US, wrote a paper where we have a non-singular stress field for this location. So there is a one over R minus R zero. So there is never, never something which is equal to zero on the denominator, taking into account the core effect. So using that, you don't have this divergence, okay? In the, the screw model, it's even uh, easier. I will show you after the break what is the DD model. And because we are just dealing with discrete position of your dislocation, they could not, never be at the exact same place. So we don't have divergence in the in the edge screw model. For the nodal code, we do have, but because, thanks to the the Kai's expression, we don't have anymore. Okay, those are the two possibilities. So this is the edge screw model. So at that time, we solve this issue just because of the discrete position of the of the nodes. My, my DD code, I will explain now, cannot move at any position. It's not in a real space. It's, it's in an integer space. So they can move one unit, two units. So they are never at the same place. Okay, that's the way we solved it. But that's a good question, yes. And the way to solve it, since we are dealing with very, very small scales, the stress are very, very, very high. So the time step here is very small. I didn't, maybe I, no, I don't, didn't write. But here my time step is close to MD simulation. It's 10 to minus 15, not 15, but maybe 10 to minus 13. So I have very, very small time step to be able to, to uh, simulate that. So I cannot do big simulations. I think I have the, the size of the box maybe it's given. I don't remember how many, you see, 15 nanometers is here. You see my box is uh, not a micron. You see, it's a very small box. Just because the, the time step is too small, so uh, I cannot do the big things, okay? We are very close to MD actually here. We are slightly bigger than MD because we can put many, many, many loops and this size is very big for MD, but it's very small, small for DD usually. But the density is so high that you, you cannot do much better. You can find some some uh, some analysis from the the U.S. groups also on uh, irradiation. I think um, Jaime Marian also investigated uh, maybe not the clear channeling but some mechanism like that. Any other question? Yes, it was periodic on the on the side, and the top and bottom were free, free surfaces. Yes, mm. all the others are periodic. Oh, this you should ask the experimentalist. Uh, just because of cascade, actually, when you you, you send a, an ion to your perfect material, it's a heavy, heavy energetic um, impact. This creates some cascade. It will move an atom that will move an over. So this introduces a lot of interstitials. You have some displacement. So interstitials are, are introduced in your material. And this, uh, of course, you have vacancies also. And interstitials and vacancies, they will migrate, they will diffuse. And because of the temperature you use, they may merge together and create some loops. This is how it works. Now, as I said, I cannot explain why you have more vacancy loops than interstitial loops. This is something for me, I don't know. You can ask people, they will tell me. I don't have the answer. I don't know why. In some material, you have more vacancy loops. So it means that the interstitial are more in solid solution. And some other materials, you more have vacan uh, interstitial loops and vacancy are in solid solution. This, I don't know why. Yeah, but why it's not the same for all the materials? This, I don't know. Why you don't have the same, because the interstitials are always fast for any materials, right? So we should have the same loops at the, at the end, and it's not the case. I know in copper it's more vacancy loops, in stainless it's more interstitial loops. So why is it like that? That's my question, this I don't know. If somebody can answer, I am happy to, 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 to learn. That's it?